Hello, everyone. Uh, today we'll begin talking about uh, Nicomachean Ethics, book two. Uh, so let us begin. So the formation of characters. Uh, Aristotle argues in uh, book one of the Nicomachean Ethics that uh, to be happy is to do the thing that is distinctive of humanity, to do it well. The thing that is distinctive of humanity is reason or activities in accordance with reason. Uh, deliberating uh, the kinds of uh, activities that give rise to personality that allow you to grow and, and form uh, intellectually and morally, that enable you to have loving relationships and so on. All of those are grounded in your capacity to think. And uh, to have a good life, a life of flourishing is a life that is uh, uh, characterized by the doing of those activities distinctive of humanities, doing them well. And uh, the doing well is the excellence of those characteristics or those activities. Uh, and the doing well are the virtues. So virtues, both intellectual and moral, are the excellences of the functions distinctive of man. So let's talk more about those virtues, those excellences distinctives of the activities of the human person. Uh, and here's the first thing he says in the book number two. Virtue and is twofold, that of thought and that of character. And we would now say things like intellectual virtue and moral virtue. That of thought both comes about and grows mostly as a result of teaching. So how do you grow intellectually? Well, through learning, right? You study and then it's mainly through the activities of studying and being taught uh, that you grow uh, in, in, in intellectual virtue, uh, which is why it requires experience and time. Uh, that of character, moral uh, virtue, on the other hand, results from habit. Uh, growing in intellectual virtue is mostly the result of training, doing the same activities over and over and developing that habit of being virtuous. That's how you grow in virtue. Um, here's another important observation that uh, Aristotle makes about the nature of the virtues. From this, it is clear that none of the virtues of character comes about to us naturally says nothing natural can be habituated to be otherwise. So there in that sentence, he gives you a, an important thesis and an actual argument for the thesis, right? The thesis is that we're not born bad or born good. We're not born virtuous or vicious. Uh, rather, nature does not give us a particular moral character. Characters are habits. When we're born, we have no habits. Uh, so that's the main claim. We're not born vicious or virtuous. Uh, we're born kind of an empty, uh, we don't have a character when we're born. Um, and then he gives an argument for thinking that nothing natural can be habituated to be otherwise. If it were natural to us to be virtuous, say, then we couldn't become vicious. And if we were natural for us to be vicious, we couldn't become virtuous. But we see in the real world that people do form their characters. They have a particular character and with time, if they keep doing a different activity, they change the character, become a different, they, they have developed personality in a different way. So habits are malleable, they're changeable. They can be habituated in different ways. Uh, and that's only possible if they're not kind of ingrained in us and they're not you know, uh, given to us by uh, naturally by birth, but rather just something that we grow into, into the decisions, the way in which we shape our personalities, the choices that we make, the build of the kind of persons that we are. Our sort of continues. Hence, the virtues come about to us in us neither by nature nor against nature. Uh, rather, we are naturally receptive of them and are brought to completion through habit. Um, our personalities, our virtues, our vices uh, are the, the, the result of the environment and the way in which we choose to respond to the environment, right? It's how we're being brought up that gives rise to different virtues and different vices. Um, our thought continues. The virtues, by contrast, we acquire by first engaging in the activities. Uh, as it's also true in the case of the various crafts. Um, we become builders by building houses and lair, lair players by playing the lair. Uh, similarly, then we become just people by doing just actions, temperate people by doing temperate actions and courageous people by doing courageous ones. Uh, so Aristotle is a very kind of commonsensical philosopher. He thinks that there's nothing mysterious here. There's nothing uh, uh, unintelligible or beyond empirical verification. Like we can just see it. Uh, how do you become a good person? Well, very simple. You look at those that are already virtuous, that already have at least a decent amount of virtue. You see what they do and you imitate them, right? You practice the activity that they, the activities that they do. 
Uh, and there's nothing mysterious, right? He says, similar to the other crafts. So if you want to be a great painter, a great builder, uh, a great mathematician, what do you do? You go to those that do it well, right? If you want to be a good painter, you go to someone who's a good painter, you take classes with them, you teach classes, you see the technique, you try to imitate the technique, right? You look at the expert and then you try to imitate the activities of the expert. And uh, with time, with practice, you will grow in you know, uh, that relevant craft. You'll become a better painter. Aristotle is saying that that's it, like that's how humans grow and develop. There's nothing mysterious here. Do you want to be courageous? Go look at the courageous people, see what they do, imitate their actions, start doing what they do, and gradually will you start forming your character in that way. You start developing a particular kind of personality to which it comes naturally to be courageous. You start becoming courageous. Likewise, for any of the virtues. And the opposite side is that the same thing would happen if you want to become vicious, right? If your role models are vicious, they, they do bad things, they're cruel, they're despicable, they're callous, and so on, and you start imitating them, you will become cruel, despicable, callous, right? That your character becomes, is going to be formed on the basis of the, the patterns or the habits that you develop. Um, so Aristotle uh, points out, quote, so it makes no small difference whether people are habituated in one way uh, or in another straight from childhood. On the contrary, it makes a huge one or rather all the difference. Uh, Aristotle is stressing how important it is for any kind of development of a skill to begin early on. So if you want to be a great piano player, what's the right strategy? Well, something like when you're six, you start playing the piano, right? You start taking classes, you practice every day, and you dedicate yourself to it. If you want to be one of the top basketball players, uh, what do you do? Well, when you're six, you start, you know, to practice. Uh, so if you want to do anything well, if you want to develop a particular kind of skill in, in, to an impressive degree, you start young, you put time into effort and, and time and effort into it, and you gradually grow in it. Uh, the same thing goes for intellectual and moral virtues. How do you grow in these? Uh, you start young and you start putting a, a time and effort into it. Does that mean if you're now 25 and you haven't really done it, that you're you know stuck, that you're never going to grow in the virtues? Well, it doesn't quite mean that. It just means that it's going to be harder for you. It's going to be harder for you precisely because your personality is growing. Your personality has morphed in different ways. And if it has morphed in a way of like fomenting a particular kind of vice, now you have to undo that habituation, vicious habituation, and start doing the virtuous one, right? So it, you're actually starting from behind uh, someone who's six years old and they haven't really developed any character yet. Someone who hasn't developed a character yet, and you're pretty young, uh, they're ahead of the curve if they're not habituated to do the opposite. Um, so that's what Aristotle is pointing out. Um, and uh, Aristotle is going to also discuss, and this is important for his picture, the role of the emotions and feelings of pleasure and pain are going to play, the role that these things are going to play in the formation of virtue, in the, in the process of becoming a good person or a bad person. Um, so here's what he says, quote, for virtue of character is concerned with pleasures and pains. Indeed, it is because of pleasure that we do base actions and because of pain that we abstain from doing noble ones. So the first caution he gives us here is that uh, people that do wrong things typically do so because they enjoy, right? There's this pleasure that they're pursuing, right? Someone who steals a car is doing the wrong thing, stealing. Why? Because they enjoy having the car, right? Uh, and it is the pleasure of the activity in question that is overriding their judgment that their activity is wrong, right? The reason is that, hey, this is wrong. Their pleasure, their feeling of the pleasure is trumping or overriding their judgment and they're doing the wrong thing because it derives pleasure. And likewise, uh, for uh, abstaining from doing the right thing. Sometimes you abstain from doing it because it's painful. You find a wallet in the street and you imagine all of the things you can do with the money, right? Like, oh, I can buy all of these things for me. And then you realize, oh, actually I know who this wallet belongs to. I know the owner of the wallet. And uh, it might be painful to you to give up the money and give it to its rightful owner, precisely because now you'll be separated from these kind of thoughts about the way in which you're going to be using the money. So sometimes you refrain from doing the right thing or the noble thing, returning the money, because of the pain that doing so might inflict upon you. That's just a psychological observation about the way in which we go about doing moral or immoral actions. Our story continues. That is why we must be brought up in a certain way <clears throat> straight from childhood. As Plato says, so as to tea, as to enjoy and be pained by the things we should, since this is the, what the correct education is. 
So this is a deep point. It's a very important point that Plato makes and Aristotle repeats and elaborates in different ways. Uh, what good education amounts to when it comes to moral formation, growing in the art of being good, is largely to habituate oneself in deriving pleasure of the things that are good or noble or right. And habituating ourselves in deriving pleasure and I'm sorry, pain in the things that are wrongful. Uh, so think of someone who grew up in a racist household, right? They were brought up to enjoy the humiliation of a particular race. Um, they were brought up to feel pain at the thought of equality with a member of a particular pain, right? Part of their moral upbringing included the habituations of pleasure and pain at the objects of you know, a particular actions. Uh, if the object of the hated race is happy, the race, the sentiment is to you know, be upset, to be humiliated, to feel pain, the happiness of the, the other. Uh, and that's kind of at the heart of, or perhaps kind of the definition of poor education, bad moral education. Whereas good education, would, moral education, would be the opposite, to develop pleasure in the good objects, the right, the noble, and the good and to derive pain, to feel pain at the thought of doing and the doing of wrongful base actions. So the gradual formation of your character in terms of experiencing pain at doing the wrong thing and pleasure at doing the right thing is an essential ingredient in the formation of your character and your moral uh, education and the process of becoming a good person or a bad one, like the racist example. <clears throat> Our thought continues. Father, the virtues are concerned with actions and feelings, and every feeling and every action entails pleasure and pain. The way that Aristotle thinks about it, uh, feelings are emotions, and emotions necessarily feel a particular way, right? You can introspectively, you have introspective access to it. If you're experiencing an emotion, you know what it feels, right? You can think about it, you can reflect upon it, and there it is, it's a bodily sensation. And Aristotle's pointing out that emotions are that kind of thing by definition. They're things that you feel, that you experience, and intertwined with them necessarily is pleasure and pain. So the virtues are uh, have to do with emotions. They, they require, they involve the emotions, and the emotions themselves require or involve pleasure and pain. Part of what is to be virtuous is to have the right kinds of emotions, to have the right kinds of pleasures for the rest of particular activities, to rejoice in the happiness of others. That's a virtuous thing to rejoice in the humiliation of others. That's a very vicious thing, right? So the emotion has to be in line with the rightness of the action. Um, <clears throat> and here's an observation that Aristotle makes about the nature of the soul. Apparently then the non-rational part of the soul is twofold since the vegetative part does not share it in reason. So Aristotle calls the vegetative part of the soul. He just means the part of you and virtue of which you do things the vegetables do. Like, uh, nutrition, reproduction, like digestion, uh, growing your hair, like the kinds of things your body does that are required for living, those are kind of allocated to you, the vegetative part of the soul, says Aristotle. We'll have to get into those details. But the point here is that those things happen in a way that your reason has no access to, you have no control over it, that you claim, hey, digestive system, work better, right? Like you, uh, it, it's not gonna obey. The, the functions of the body that are, you know, vegetative, that are, you know, growth and reproduction and so on, happen independently of reason. Reason has no control over them. And Aristotle is gonna make a distinction between that and those, the vegetative processes of your body, with the emotions, which are not really rational in any deep sense of the word rational, but they, in some sense, partake from reason. So here's what Aristotle says. Um, uh, they do not share reason in a way, but the appetitive part, indeed the desiring part as a whole, does in some way. So the appetitive part, that's, that's the desiring part, that's the emotions, that's, a, uh, that's that part, which is not really reasonable as such, it's not reason, uh, uh, it's not reason, it's something else but it shares in reason because it is able to re listen to reason and obey it. Um, it doesn't directly obey it. It's not like a slave to, uh, to reason, but reason is able to mold it. So go back to the example of the races I gave you early. So the, the person grew up in the racist household, he grew up uh, to enjoy the humiliation of a particular minority group, uh, right? So the feeling of rejoice uh, was connected with humiliation of the other. 
Uh, suppose the person goes to college and they meet some of those members of the minority. And then as this person starts talking to them, it turns out that they're not as despicable as you've been brought up to believe. They're not as inferior as you've been brought up to believe. In fact, the you know, person who was brought up with those racist feelings comes to realize they're actually pretty much like me, except they have different life experiences. They're deep down humans like myself. So this racist person comes to regret having those feelings, racist feelings. Here's the observation that Aristotle makes. That person has some control over their feelings. The next time they see someone of the minority race being humiliated and find within themselves this kind of rejoicing, this feeling of joy, they can tell the feeling of joy, hey, stop, stop, right? They can start slowly, gradually molding themselves, habituating themselves, changing them, themselves to no longer feel that. And the observation that Aristotle makes is that we can do that. We have the power to, with time, with practice, with habituation, change how the way we feel about different things, the things that give us pleasure, that give us pain, that in, in kind of mold the emotions in different ways. They're moldable in a particular way, and especially in the long run. And that makes them share and reason, says Aristotle. And that's why he thinks the emotions are kind of essential to what it is to be human as well, because reason is distinctive of humanity, and the emotions kind of intertwine with reason. So the emotions are important for virtue as well. So here's the kind of picture that Aristotle gives us. A fully virtuous agent has the following characteristics. One, they do the right thing. They, I, they can reason, they can think, they can identify what the right thing is. So they do it. They do the thing that they rightfully judge to be correct. Two, they do it for the right reasons. Uh, in uh, sometimes people do the right thing for the wrong reasons. Like think of a politician who, uh, you know, helps the poor in times of crisis, not because he cares about the poor, but because that's going to get, get the politician to get re-election, or it's going to help in you know, his public persona, uh, public uh, image. Um, that's the wrong reason, right? It's still the right thing to do, helping those in, in need, but it's the wrong reason. The right reason should be because those in, uh, people need need help, right? That's the right thing to do. So what's the right reasons? Because the action is good and noble, says Aristotle. So the right person does the right thing, help those in need. Why? Because that's the right thing, because they're in need. I mean, th those are the right reasons. And here's the third element. Uh, the virtuous agent, for them to be fully virtuous, they feel in the right way, they have the right emotions. They don't have the racist emotions, they have the good emotions. Uh, they feel compassion, they feel kindness, they feel love. Uh, the emotions are in alignment with the judgments of reason. Reason says it is wrong to feel enjoyment of the humiliation of others. And then the body does not feel the emotion of the humiliation of the other. It feels compassion at the humiliation of the other, right? So it's not just reason judging adequately what the right thing is, but the feelings of the, the emotions of the fully virtuous agents feeling appropriately, right? Being in alignment with right reason. And number four is kind of intertwined with three. So they're really two different ways of saying similar things. But number four is that the fully virtuous agent rejoices, enjoys doing the right thing. Uh, they are uh, motivated to act for the right thing because they judge it to be correct. That's one, kind of, that's one condition. They feel they have the emotions in alignment, that's two. And when they do it, they rejoice in it. They derive pleasure out of doing the right thing. That's the fully virtuous agent picture. And uh, Aristotle notes that that's a very high bar. And that's kind of the last observation I'll, I'll make for this uh, chapter two. Uh, becoming fully virtuous is a difficult art. It's hard to attain that status. And here's some of the things that Aristotle point, points out about the difficulty of being fully virtuous. Uh, quote, it is also that way then with temperance, courage, and the other virtues. For someone who avoids and fears everything and endures nothing becomes coward. Whereas someone who fears nothing at all and goes to face everything becomes rash. And cowardice and rashness are both extremes. They're, they're, they're not virtues. They're different ways of failing to do things well, and they're two different vices. Similar, similarly, someone who indulges in every pleasure and abstains from none becomes intemperate. And overindulges in pleasures, you know, it's a way of not being temperate. Whereas someone who avoids all pleasures becomes boorish. A boorish person is someone who does not know how to enjoy life. Uh, but uh, that's also uh, an excess. Uh, they become insensible in a way. So there are different ways of failing to do the right thing, failing to find the middle path, which is the path of virtue. And here's another way of saying the same thing. Temperance then and courage are ruined by excess or deficiency. 
and are presented by the medial condition. So the middle uh, path is virtue, and the middle path is a path between excess and deficiency. Excess and, defi and, de and deficiency of what? Well, it depends on the virtue. In the case of courage, excess and fearlessness. Like there's no fear at all. You just jump and do foolish things because you have no fear. In deficiency, like you don't have enough courage to fight, uh, uh, to uh, confront the adversity. Um, in the case of pleasure, uh, the overindulgence person is an excess of pleasure and the boorish person is deficient in, in, in enjoying life. Uh, the temperate person knows when and how to have fun to a point that is not detrimental to their overall happiness, but uh, also not you know, boorish. Uh, so the virtue is a mean between two extremes. So there are more ways of going wrong than there are of doing it correctly. Uh, and it gets more complicated. It gets even harder, so here's what Aristotle says. Father, it is possible to err in many ways, whereas there is only one way to be correct. That is why erring, erring is easy and being correct difficult, since it is easy to miss a target but difficult to hit. Uh, there are different ways of messing up, say if you're playing the piano. Uh, there are all sorts of ways of falling short to giving a great performance. You can mess up in all sorts of ways. Uh, but there's really just the one way of getting it fully well, right? There's just a full uh, way of doing things, playing, the, 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 having a performance, a piano performance. That's a great one. Um, that doesn't mean that anytime you, you make a mistake, you're just done. You're not, you know, a good, a good uh, musician at all, right? Of course not. It just means that there's this gradation and that all, you can mess up in all sorts of ways. And the less you mess up, the more adequate your performance is, the better you are as a musician. But if you're going to be a, like a truly great musician, you really need no mistakes. And that's, you know, that's much harder to attain. There are all sorts of ways of messing up, though you get closer and closer to being better. Uh, so here's another quote to the same kind of effect. This is why it takes work to be excellent, to develop the virtues. Uh, getting angry is also something everyone can do and something easy, right? You just get angry almost any time. Uh, as is giving or spending money, you can just spend money without thinking. Determining whom to give it to, the money, uh, though, is in how much and when and for the sake of what and in what way, you know, uh, uh, one, the way in which you give the money as well. That is no longer something everyone can do, nor is it easy. And this has nothing to do with just money spending as such, but any activity commanded or recommended by virtue is going to have multiple ingredients. When is the right occasion? What's the right way of presenting it? What are the right reasons? What's the right extent of doing this? And all of those factors, you can mess up in any of them. Uh, so the story that I sort of paints at the end of the day is that being a great virtuous agent is like being a great performer. Uh, uh, there are, it takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of effort, and there are many ways of messing it up, but it's worth doing, and it is kind of the thing that makes your life worth having. It's the way in which you grow as a person. It's the art of flourishing as an individual and doing the thing that defines you as a person. Okay, I'll stop here. I'll see you later. Bye.